Hello there, dear listener. My name is Matthias, and I am the game master for the Black Madonna that we have just played through. And with me today, I have Yalmar, who plays Bjorn. Hello there. And we also have Craig, who has played Carver. Hey, yeah. Uh, hello. It's great to have you here, and it's great to uh, to have all of you out there listening. And this is our first attempt at a postmortem of a campaign, and it's uh, recorded two days after we've had our final play session. Hopefully, this has given us a little bit of perspective and a chance to process what we felt during both the end uh, of the campaign as well as the campaign as a whole. I should warn you, though, that this conversation will very likely jump all over the place, going back and forth in time, but uh, hopefully that will still be uh, enjoyable. We will be making a second post-mortem when all the episodes have been aired, which, uh, if nothing changes, should be in March of uh, 2018. And for this one, we will also be inviting all listeners to ask questions. Uh, So, where to begin, I suppose? What if we actually began with the beginning? How did you feel when we started the campaign um, about your characters and how they interacted together. Uh, Yalmar, what? Well, it was it was so much fun just in constructing this character from the start and all the ideas we have had. Um, I, I don't remember. When we, okay, when we started creating Bjorn, was he originally uh, going to be the KGB agent? Um... What what was our first? Do you remember what our first line of thought there was? Because I think we wanted some him to be something that had a bit of brawn. Well, I think didn't we say a Patrick Bateman type originally? Yes, yeah. we originally talked about sort of a businessman type, so it wouldn't be that well, maybe a bit pro, prone to violence, but not with the military background perhaps that he eventually had. And it was just so exciting starting the campaign and really getting into that, you know, playboy style character and, you know, just very subtly adding hints on what he might be looking for and uh, how, how he lives his life, how he goes into a room and examines it and so on. But I, I really ha- had a lot of fun holding back, so to speak. <laughs> with the character <laughs> yeah and I mean if we go back to what you mentioned here about uh, about Bateman from American Psycho exactly I mean yeah that's, that is that was sort of the starting point um, I, I remember we, we sort of looked a little bit at movies that could serve as good inspiration for the characters and um, we'll come to that later we had the ninth gate that was sort of the inspiration for, for Carver um, and then yeah Patrick Bateman from American Psycho just um who is a, it's such an kind of iconic um, sort of 80s 90s yeah. movie it really has the right style and then and then that character is just so interesting and it felt like yeah maybe we could do something with that um, yeah. that could also serve as sort of the I suppose the soldier of the group the the brawn uh, if you will exactly and that just developed from there I think I'm um, not sure it was you sending the suggestion yeah I think it was that he might be the Ronin type. I'm not sure. Do you remember? Yeah, I think I think uh, it might have been me. We we of course looked at the suggestions that are uh, part of the, the Black Madonna book. There's a number of different backgrounds there, and I think yeah, we we looked at that one. We we liked it quite a bit. We definitely wanted him to have a lot of secrets that we could then unravel throughout the campaign. Um, and of course, you know, K- the KGB background also made a lot of sense uh, from a. You know, that, then he would be able to, that he would be able to to do various military stuff. Then wouldn't really be weird. It would be fully natural. Whereas if he was actually Patrick Bateman, I mean, you know, if you find a a chainsaw or something like that, you don't yeah. know how to use that. But you know, exactly, if you come down to you know flying a MiG twenty nine or something <laughs> like that. That would probably be uh, a little bit far fetched. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. We had that, though, in mind fairly early, and I I was uh, waiting with uh, bated breath towards the uh, 
the uh, Meg dog fight that I was sure was going to happen sometimes as you just you just dropped like oh by the way your character can fly uh, fighter jets <coughs> and then you started unloading YouTube clips from <laughs> films <laughs> with uh, dog fights and stuff and I'm like oh yeah okay this is cool <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that was one of those things that um, I had as a bit of a of a dream to at, at some point realize uh, throughout the campaign. Um, but yeah, that's a little bit how we got started with Bjorn. But if we turn our attention over to to Carver, um, how did how did you feel when we started the campaign mm. for, for him and and uh, interesting? Yeah. I mean, I felt so. I felt first of all quite comfortable in the sort of trope I was going to play because I thought, you know, okay, academic type. That's, you know, I, I, I think I understand how to do that. And I was very interested to see where things were going to go. Because, again, managing not to spoil anything, which, to be honest, is quite hard at this moment anyway, to even find spoilers. But even that, I tried not to look up anything. So all I had was the name of the module. And knowing from what we've been discussing that it was going to be 1990 and it was going to be very historically grounded. Because, you know, even in the early thing, it was quite obvious that there's obviously lots of things going on here to do with, like, the past and uh, 1941 and all that. And I was just very really curious, like, oh, what sort of adventure even is it going to be? Because the name was quite mysterious then, the Black Madonna. Mm. And it was like, oh, like, are we going to be... Like, the very first session, like, oh, okay, we've got some weird cultist people. We've got this woman. Oh, what's going on? Like, I... Looking back at it now, I find it quite funny that one of the very first things that happened, the mysterious disappearance of Sophia, ended up not really being that vital to anything. But back at the time, I was like, ooh, ooh, that must be really important. That must be yeah, really important, that. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, I remember you guys uh, had a lot of questions about Sophia, and, and it seemed yeah. like you had really sort of taken a... Uh, Taken a bit of a liking to to her, which is why um, she pops up later in the story as well. Uh, originally, she's really just supposed to be a throwaway character. She's just someone yeah. who's who who acts as kind of like a mirror for you and like asks you questions um, and, oh, yeah. and like allows you to explain who you are and how you view life mm. and, yeah. and how that you makes view perfect what is important sense. In, but, in life. But the way you had her disappear, it, it was that classic thing where you probably didn't intentionally mean to be like she disappeared mysteriously. Oh, you, were, but, you probably meant to be like, oh, she just went to the toilet. <laughs> so, so I, I will say she was supposed to um, sort of disappear in a very, in a mysterious way. There were a number of things that happened at the dinner that were supposed to be mysterious because that's sort of right. a cult thing. It's, it's mm. when the illusion is Otto sort of, and his wife. Otto and his wife, yeah, exactly. With the first, it's uh, Otto smoking, and then it's actually the wife smoking at the end, which yeah. is a bit odd. Um, so it's just supposed to we're supposed to throw in a, a few of those small sort of weird things that are happening so that you're always sort of on edge and thinking hey is what i'm seeing now actually real um mm. and then what is real what isn't so that was sort of yeah. trying to start that up because as we're starting that's when when basically the illusion for you guys is, is really starting to Shift. small cracks yeah you know, that are forming i think maybe but she was just really interested in the same things as the character. She was kind of into the occult, so it felt like okay, she could, prob uh, she could like either like lend a hand to our current mission then, which was cataloging books, and then I think we, I don't know, maybe we just visualized her as a, a attractive character, like who mm. was uh, in interested in us, and maybe that but just made the both of mm. us interested as well. <laughs> and um, and what did I think of Bjorn? I think I quite liked already at the start how I felt a little bit more of the dignified, sort of serious type compared to Bjorn, who was a bit more, even from the start, a bit more playful and a bit more like, hey, you know, which I think made sense. He was supposed to be a playboy and I was supposed to be a business associate. So that was quite fun to get into. And it was very interesting to also hold back on my, um, the idea that obviously I knew a lot more than I was letting on, but... In polite society, I was just a book dealer. You know, you don't go around telling people, actually, all the demons are real. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, and you summoned some. <laughs> oh, yeah. yes, I did. Yes, I did. Uh, and so, yeah, so I, I wonder if that came across that I was trying to be very initially, like, logical. Like, oh, no, no, I, you know, I, I know I deal in weird stuff, but no, 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 this is all logical and this is all explainable phenomena and that sort of, that sort of thing. Didn't last yeah, long. well, I think you still had that. After, I mean, or at least he tried to see things as logical. Oh, I don't know. It's just, it's like, oh yeah, well maybe not. When you were just rambling on, it's all a dream, and 
Nothing is real. I think I held it till basically until my stability finally went very low, and then I was like, no, unfortunately, mm. I think it's over now for sanity. <laughs> uh, it's like I didn't expect him to. Because I didn't know much about the game in general, I didn't expect him to swing towards the, the the powers that he would have later on. I kind of, it kind of felt like he would be sort of more of the brains, you know, just throughout the whole thing. But mm. then it really, getting into the dream world, for example, how he really sort of just paved the way in several of the situations. Well, I think uh, that's, a very, again, if we finish up talking about the beginning, I think the very selection of your class in this game is a big character-shaping element because I was an occultist. So the occultist, the rules I was given, uh, imply or already, oh, actually, no, already you're some sort of dabbler in magical things. All the moves are actually very focused on, like, like um, you suggested, Matty, a soul. That's why I made mm-hmm. my soul hard because mm-hmm. most of them were actually soulful. Like, read, like, what did I not pick? Let's have a look at some of the things I didn't pick. I know one of them was auras, because I... Ah, it, it could have been useful, but... Nah, reading auras. It's, <laughs> it's cool. It's, here was... Because here was very sort of like, you can just tell if someone's nasty or not. And I was like, Ugh, that's not that interesting. And what else did I not do? Let's bring it up, guys. A cultist. Da, 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 da. Here we go. So, um... So, yeah, dreamer... Ah, yeah, Exorcist. Now, that sounded really interesting, but I thought, how many people are going to be demon-possessed in this adventure? I have no idea. Maybe none, and I think in the end, yeah, no one needed an exorcism, really. Maybe. Maybe one or two people. Uh, And then there was Crafty as well, yeah. Which I think Crafty, what does that even do? Makes me better at doing cool, yeah, cool things, and I was not cool. I was never (laughs) cool in this adventure. So, uh, Bjorn, how did you, uh, Bjorn, <laughs> the Almar, how did you feel mm. like you got along with uh, with uh, Craig's character? Like, was it, like, how was the interaction, act, how were the interactions there in the beginning? Did they feel natural and pleasant, or how was it? Yeah, I think, I mean, because they sort of strive towards the same goal, I think they, I mean, both sort of bes- perceived each other as, as means to an end, really. Uh, from the start, I mean, I had the money for Craig to come across, uh, or Carver, though, or Bjorn had the money. <laughs> I don't know, it feels more natural to say, say I and Carver. Yeah. Uh, I had the money, he could get the books that he was interested in, and I could get the books I was interested in uh, through him. It's like, we just, yeah, it's a good working uh, professional relationship. And... Uh, Let's see. When did it sort of take spin? It, it's like when he suddenly comes home to me and is being hunted by these three. And oh, wait, no, that was when I was tripping. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, of course we first had all the night nightmares and all that stuff. Mm. Uh, yes, yeah, so it's it's around the second episode there where you have the fever dreams and and yeah. You see all these really, really weird things, and you're, you know, locked up in this apartment for a few days. That's when we move from, you know, the first episode where everything was kind of, I mean, you know, mostly normal, really. There's a guy with night vision goggles at the end, and there's uh, some <laughs> disappearing people and, and, and stuff like that, but nothing, nothing really super strange. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, exactly. Comes and he wasn't even dreams. sure that he actually saw someone. I mean, uh, yeah. And when it goes over to the visions, it's like, okay, so maybe he didn't actually see someone with night vision goggles from the start. Maybe that was just all uh, visions from the past, you know, just haunting him a bit. And and then it, take, it starts off the adventure with I- Irene's call and going over to Magda's and all that. And I suppose that's when we first start working together on something that, you know, is not just professional. Hmm. Yes, I think I would agree. I think the first episode was, well, even the first beginning of the session. Because that's the funniest thing, by the way, whenever people listen to this with me, it's always that first episode, and then the second, they go, oh, oh suddenly it's very different. And I find that quite funny, because to us, it was just the first hour. <laughs> that was our starting point, yeah. that then an hour in, we were already doing different things. But to the first listeners, it's like, oh, yeah, it's all very different now, isn't it? And I <laughs> felt, um, yeah, 
that shared experience was a bit of a like, oh, something's happening to us. So my character would be thinking like, maybe this is, you know, more than just a man. Like, it was the difference between me just going off back home and doing everything by myself. You know, like, sorry, Bjorn, I'm busy today. I'm ill. You know, that sort of thing. Yeah. Well, how did you discover that you had the curse on you? Because I remember how it happened to Bjorn. He was there uh, with a, with a Magda and he went with her to the hospital and then suddenly mm. he discovered it on himself. But when did Carver actually discover I, it? I discovered it while I was at the flat, still wait, looking around, and then suddenly I had my flashback in the mirror and I'm pretty sure after the flashback I looked down and had the boils, yeah. Yep, that's how it happened. And then yeah. uh, that's, oh. that's when you saw the worms like coming out of the boils uh, in the mirror and everything mm. was freaky. And then there was Jenkins there. Oh, shit. I thought I thought that was just a vision that uh, that after that moment, they, it was just in this moment that he saw them and then they were gone. No. So I didn't really realize no, that. I think that was the... I, I felt that was the moment we were both jointly, like, cursed. Although uh. I, I assume the curse began with the dreams. I assume yeah. that was the start. So the curse of the begins curse. when Magda touches you um, yeah. at the uh, at the gold plaque dinner. That's when it oh, begins. That's when you get uh, infected, um, and then you have sort of the the dreams is when when it's sort of the, the incubation period or whatever you call it. That's when that's when it really grows within you, yeah. and then you have some normality after that, and then comes. Uh, Matty, the yes, actual I feel I have course. to ask now. What happens if you have a character who's like, I don't touch people. Magda comes towards you. No, I don't. No, no. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's an interesting challenge, isn't Roll it? The... to avoid harm and she will throw yeah. herself at you. <laughs> so, I mean, in, in the uh, campaign book, it sort of specifies that you should ensure that the characters do touch Magda. So, yeah. you know, the, the point is then to find it and make it natural in a way. And I mean, normally, because it, nothing weird has really happened at that point, you're at a dinner and you're shaking hands with people. I mean... Hmm. Yeah. You'd have to be a fairly weird character to not to not do that. But of course, you could That's... also have actually, if it's a group of people, for example, well, perhaps one of the characters don't carry the uh, the infection. Um, perhaps. Yeah. I mean, it's not necessarily needed, you know, in a way. Could it as long as there's from... another, as long as there's another, um, what should I say? As long as there's another reason for the person then to do what they're doing, it's basically yeah. all fine. Can it can can they transfer within the group? I mean, if one doesn't have it and then touches another one, or no, is it just through Magda? It was yeah. supposed to be just through Magda, yeah. Otherwise, you know, yeah. you guys would have gone gone everyone. around infecting uh, half yeah. of Berlin, um, which uh, <laughs> Good time. would have been that would be a very different adventure. Ah, yeah. uh, boils! <laughs> exactly. You started some kind of pandemic. No, no, mass it's, uh, panic. Yeah, yeah. So that's sort of how it's supposed to happen, and of course, it goes back to. Then that you have been selected to be the carriers of this because um, you are seen as um, as sort of the right kind of people uh, who could actually help um, Chigidil to to uh, get rid of the uh, the three Russians and actually uh, to kill them and to conduct the ritual and to release the incarnates and that's sort of. Uh, why it's why it's the two of you, or in a normal campaign, mm. you would have maybe a group of four or something like that. It's, I mean, it states that it's stated that it's supposed to be people who have who are very complicated, have a very low mental balance, for example. There's there's something dark about them, and I think in that sense, both of you pretty much fit that bill, right? Yes, we did. Yeah, and then it appeared that we we actually were both born in Russia there. That too, yeah, and you all both had connections with Magda also, so it mm. makes a lot of sense that of course you. Uh, you you were the ones selected for it. Craig, did you know that you had a Russian heritage? No. No, you didn't. No, actually. no, that was the wonderful twist he had yeah. hiding all the way to the very end. Like, because yeah. uh, obviously I came up with my backstory, but yeah. then there was no reason that backstory could be altered. I because I I said no, I'm from England, and I yeah. But I had the the, the I assume. The way, because the way I chose the back, the dark secret was the recommended dark secret for the the campaign. That the <laughs> flashbacks, and it said you have flashbacks of ice and of cold and of of things. So I assume that that is tied into that background choice, Matthias, or, or am I not correct on that? So in in the the the, um, the Black Madonna book, yeah, that is one of the the, the background sort of, sort of things that you can have the dark secrets. Um, and flashbacks is is one of those, but it doesn't actually specify that it means that the character is um, then from Russia. So that was something more that I came up with to try to explain, well, actually, why 
why do you have those flashbacks? Because they're very interesting mm-hmm. sort of thematically and, and from a narrative perspective mm-hmm. to throw in there because you can make freaky shit happen uh, whenever you want. Um, but like there should be some reason for it. There should be some reason for mm. why you were also selected. I mean, um, Richter talks about this immunodeficiency with connections to Russia, yeah. which is specifically mentioned in the book. So it, in a way, it felt then more natural that, yeah, you also are actually from Russia, but you you have no memories of that and you've grown up in Britain you think you're British and, and mm. you just yeah, have no reason to think that you would be anything and my parents that. were obviously escaped and then were killed because yeah. pro- presumably because all the, the children met violent ends in some way or other from yeah because they were all so messed up from their experiences and, and mm. yeah, what what uh, what happened to your mother was that yeah your father murdered your mother um, because of you know the traumas that he was going oh. through and, oh no yeah. Oh, that's shock! Oh gosh. Wow. So, uh, so yeah, that that actually did uh, was supposed to happen. That's the, what the doctor said then about you know he described some kind of violent slaughter. I don't know whether that was true or not. That that may have just been part of that horrible vision there. But but that was the idea, and you end up in a um, an orphanage that is also pretty nasty. An orphanage in Romania, uh, which I don't know if you've heard about Romanian orphanages during the Cold War, but they were not the nicest places. Um, and then your uh, your the, the people you consider to be your parents they show up there and then they they give you this life that you have. And I did, and then I took their lives away. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting how you happen to choose uh, an exterior very similar to my character. It's like when we have these dreams and they are children, they look very similar, and that was just how it happened to be. Even though. I mean, you thought he was English, and mm. I, I knew my character was Russian. They look similar as, as children, which is like also this tying that together was cool. that. Yeah. It was a really cool coincidence, actually, because I mean, when you yeah. designed your character, uh, Craig, I mean, you didn't design him with the intention of him being, you know, Russian, which I mean, there's yeah. like quite mm. a few blonde people in Russia, um, but uh, rather with, uh, with the idea that he was, that he was English. And uh, yeah. 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 Well, again, even the, I mean, I mean, as adults, we looked a bit different, but the fact that I just, my standard, I was just like, ah, oh, blonde hair, uh, you know, sort of, oh, I can't, I'm really bad. I'm pretty sure he does have blue eyes, but I kept, like, sometimes I think yeah. he had grey eyes. I don't I think, think so. I was consistent with his eye colour. <laughs> <laughs> or grey or something like that. Yeah, yeah. blue or grey, yeah. But then, and then you were blonde as well. I was like, oh, what do you know? We're both blonde. Yeah. I don't normally play blonde characters, actually. I normally go for the my own hair colour, which is auburn, just because, <laughs> because, yeah. It's yeah. like, it, what, did you talk about your disadvantage there for a bit? Is, was that uh, the flashbacks? Uh, no, that was my dark secret. My oh. original disadvantage was the stalker, which yes. was right. in the form of the book collector guy. Yes, the that was Hans Weber, who was yes. chasing for his book. And I mean, you know, I think we talked about this uh, in... Um, uh, and, and some of the Ask for the Moons that we have been doing, but but uh, the way that uh, when you normally play cult, those disadvantages are pretty much what drives the story because you're rolling for them every session, and, and that determines you know yeah. is your stalker going to catch up with you today uh, or yeah. not, and then you know the GM GM works with with those roles, but um, we I sort of tried to weave it in more as as uh, sort of sort of side stuff that sort of helped maybe develop your character or help develop the world a little bit. And um, that's how the idea of, of then Hans Weber that um, Greg you suggested that that be the, the guy with the, the book um, and, and how we ended up bringing him into into the campaign because he's not of course a, a part of the Black Madonna he is mm. he's one of yeah. our our own creations. But it was mm. nice that because because of what we had in our pasts it wasn't really sh- certain which parts were connected to the campaign and which were just you know part of the character. And I liked yes. that because it kept kept you, you know, speculating about who were these people actually attacking us in in my apartment. I was like, for a long, the longest time, we didn't actually know what faction they belonged to. And I mean, not even after we went to the mansion did we know for sure that he was tied together with them. I don't think it was until we reached the SA that we actually got confirmed, and you know, f- found this picture of the red. Uh, uh, the red-faced man. Yeah, the man with the swollen mm. face, uh, Alexei yeah. Schlesinger. Yeah, 
Yeah, exactly. No, I mean, you were, um, I remember you guys speculating quite a lot about um, who who is it actually that's coming to kill you. Um, and, and yeah, there were a lot of different factions uh, at work there. But um, basically what happened was that, uh, you know, the guys in the, the silver uh, Dodge van, that's Alexei and his guys who are connected to uh, the Slavic Association and who are keeping tabs on you, basically because of the fact that, um, you know, you met the Russians at the gold plaque dinner. Uh, you met Magda there, and they saw you, and you remember they were very afraid, right? Mm -hmm. They looked like they had seen, you know, ghosts, because to them, you looked like these demons that were out to kill them, because that's how um, Chigidil wanted them to, to see you. Oh, so they saw visions of demons when they saw us. Yeah, exactly. Um, oh! So that, so that they would also want to, uh, you know, w want to come after you, like, so that there would be enmity between between you, so that you would want to to, to kill each other. Oh, mm. this is so cool. I'm really seeing this as, as, a, as a cinematic thing now, how when we come in to uh, do the ritual on them, maybe they don't even hear what we're saying. Maybe just they just see the demons and, they, and, and our voices are like distorted, speaking in strange tongues, you know, and they... Mm. And, we walk around them and we and we, it's like we don't attack them we just perform some sort of ritual but they don't actually exactly know what we're doing and they're just frozen with fear of, of seeing this yeah frozen with fear and then the incarnates probably also um, use the, the power that they have over them in that very moment to like them, keep, yeah. keep them paralyzed essentially so that you could carry out the ritual because these are nasty dudes like they shouldn't just stand around there they yeah exactly you know, like no matter how scary you the, look like they are they are very you know they're very capable that guys. was very much the thing that like yeah annoyed my character was that we got no answers because they were like not and i was like why and uh, you yeah. know foresight it's obvious that something was going on but in the heat of the moment it was like no we don't have time to worry about what's happening to them yeah. There's, their guards are going to come in and shoot us you know <laughs> yeah but i really like that your character tried really hard to get some answers out out of them mm. And this was, of course, something that, uh, you know, Carver came back to many times during the, the campaign. I felt like this, trying to get answers out of these uh, yeah. <laughs> various antagonists that we have that uh, are all sort of supposed to remain quite mystical, you know, and not, and not yep. reveal too much. Because, of course, you yep. know, it's that kind of a story, right? It's like if you think of it as a movie, it's the, mm. you know... Uh, the the, sh hey. the guys in the shadow say something mysterious and then they disappear. That's sort of how you want it hey. to, to move. By the... Uh by the end of the adventure, you know, the last one or two times I did it, I was far more like, fine, fine, I get it. You're not going to give me any answers. Fine. I don't <laughs> so want so yeah. that's why I threw yeah. in. That's why I threw in Strelkov and actually had him be completely the opposite. Like, no, I actually don't. You want to know why I'm doing this? Like, yeah. he was actually, like, oh, he now really, he really, want he really like, wanted to explain it because he wanted to show that he actually has a reason for it. He's not yeah, just some exactly. maniacal and I demon. Like that. How, create, how, how Carver reacted to that. What? So you can do this and that and then just laugh at us? It's like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Classic. Exactly. It's like, that's exactly. what you, that was you're, you're supposed to do. And that was the point. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. So um, if we... Um, if we, if we think about this mission then that you have been on, that <clears throat> the characters have been on, they, they get got infected by this disease, which basically gives them then you know, a reason that they must do this. Because if they don't do it, then they will die, right? But do you yeah. think, without that, do you think that you would have had a reason to to do what you did? Or would you have been able to find a way to motivate your characters through this? Or, or was the infection the, the you know, deciding factor? Hmm. Well, you mean, okay, so if... If we had been just... Okay, so let's say we didn't have the uh, visions or anything then. Just remove the, com the curse completely... <laughs> yeah, just what, just that... take the curse away, but then you can still have like you know uh, the essay can still come after you for through example. the illusion. Okay. Anyway, but like if okay. it wasn't yet okay, if you don't do this, you're gonna die. If if the, take that part away, but everything else. Yeah. Is the same. Okay. Uh, so I would see it then as that Magda would still be missing, and mm -hmm. Irene would ask us to check up on her. <clears throat> we probably would, and. Then we would come back to my place and suddenly we'd be hunted and we would be attacked. Then I suppose we would go to Berlin anyway to see... Yeah, I, th I think we'd still uh, do the whole thing, but with less... I don't know, pressure perhaps mm. somehow. But I still, people would be hunting us. I mean, we'd still be in, in mortal danger if we didn't 
act. Yeah. I feel, yeah, um, most of it would still be the same, but it could all be approached just a little more methodically. Like, yeah. I think we would all, all the plans we ever came up with always had an element of we don't have time. Yeah. If we had time, it might be a bit more like, oh, okay, let's hide out for a few days. Let's really plot this, like, espionage mission. Also, yeah. the fact that I always wanted to, early on at least, escape. I never really got around to it because, again, he didn't give us a chance because of the disease. But if we could, I wanted to be like, we need to leave the country. We need to get out of here. This isn't our business anymore. I, I just want to get away from this thing because I, I didn't want to know all the answers at the start. I was curious, but I was more curious about just getting away and moving on because that was what I used to do. My mm. character's backstory was that I always ran away from problems for the most part, like moving all the co moving countries and all that. Because yeah, and uh, my mm. character has done that too, so mm. maybe that would somehow be a, a logic there. But I think at the same time, because my character probably has ha sort of, he's kind of done with running, and he's probably also missing having a mission in that way, you know, have I mean, a bit of the the mindset that you have. And he's a bit of, he's, I mean, he is a bit of a killer, really. He, mm. uh, he, he likes. It does, I won't say likes killing people, but it's like it, it, the whole thing just helps him focus and turn off his brain for a bit. And I think it was, even though he l pretended to enjoy l pretending to be Bjorn and that, he he probably ha was a bit frustrated with how much he had left behind. Mm. I, I definitely feel as our mission develops onto the stage of the incarnates, that changed things because that made me feel more morally obligated to um, stop what was happening because as a sort of knowledge hoarder, I was also a knowledge protector. I believe that knowledge should be known but controlled and that very much went with, I think these guys are trying to do something with the knowledge that's very right. bad and could hurt lots of people and that, if I can stop that, is a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And... and, and now that you mention that the the whole knowledge thing and my my dip my character I did of course have a big uh, curiosity that has developed recently about the occult and about these mysteries so for that curiosity as well he he might well have have tied a line on that but it would still have required a little bit more like you convincing your characters uh, in a way that yeah you know you really should in spite of all the dangers here you you really should uh, continue investigating and you really you yeah. should put yourself in danger, right? Yeah, and and seeing Magda die like that also kind of put the pressure on it, what is actually going on. Yeah, yeah, that's right. No, and and that's, of course, why the disease exists as, as a way of ensuring that basically the entire group joins it. Uh, because, it's, you know, in cult you can build really, like, you can build really messed up characters um, and, and they can be very different from each other. And it can be quite a challenge to find a reason for well, why should you put yourself in danger here? Why should you follow this up? I mean, do these people really, does Magda really mean that much to you? Um, do you do you really care to know why she disappeared? Do you really want to go up against these scary mob bosses and ex-Stasi agents? Th there's yeah. plenty of reasons. And do you have curiosity to, about the occult yeah, there, at all? Yeah, and th there's plenty of reasons to run away, and that's why I think that uh, Gunnar and Mikael put the curse in here. And it's not the only adventure that does this. There's plenty of you know, RPG adventures in general that, that use this, this trope, simply because it is mm. efficient, because it, it, sort of, it, it sort of shuts down any other argument, like, why should I do this? Well, okay, do you want to die? I mean, that's what's going to happen if you don't do it. Mm. So, your choice. And especially in a structured adventure like this, because as you said, if you were playing full-on um, cult with just, you know, like uh, the campaign that follows characters... It would be all right. You could have them avoid things because then you go, all right, we'll explore your disadvantages or your dark secret because those are in your character. So you can run from those, but they will come for you eventually. There's the idea of those. You can't escape that. But obviously mm. for an adventure like this, it's like, well, actually, I'd rather you did the adventure. We, we, we go to Brazil and just have a little bar there for five years. <laughs> exactly exactly yeah yeah so so that makes a lot of sense um another thing i can say is also that um one of the changes that um i was a part of, of putting together now in in um, the new version of the black madonna has to do with timing and like how much time passes between each event and, and passes in general through the campaign because in the original way that it's written it's actually supposed to be over several months and there are um places where it's like okay uh, from this event to this event, two weeks pass. 
um, and then something happens. And that was something that um, I, when I read it, uh, always found it a little bit... It felt like it would be a challenge uh, as a GM to to make those kind of time jumps. Um, I, I much more prefer that it is um, sort of a story that just keeps going um, and that you don't have to sort of explain well, what what is happening in the downtime here. Um, mm-hmm. and, and certainly that you don't have to wait for a specific date for something to happen. Um, I mean, well, an, I mean, an example in the could end. be um, an example could be, for example, the the ritual at uh, Pagodin's mansion. I think in in the original when you're finding it, it's like yeah, it's set for it could be I think it's several weeks in, in the future actually when it's supposed to happen. Um, so you would have you know yeah several weeks to to prepare and and and, and uh, do other things I guess in the, in the meantime. But uh, what do you guys think? Did it feel like it was too sort of, yeah, too, did it happen too quickly? Would you have preferred to I, have the long breaks or? I felt all the beginning was perfectly paced for me. Like I was absolutely fine with that. I worried towards the end, things maybe progressed a bit quickly, but I felt that wasn't because of you as a GM. I thought that was our, our player choices just seeming to, conveniently get us quite quickly through things but it like uh, but I was very divided because I kind of because that whole point because I wanted things to progress quickly do you know what I mean like as a viewer I was like oh I want to come on let's see what happens next like yeah but like like the hmm, do you know what I mean hmm. yeah definitely and, and I can hmm. and one thing I can say there is that you know the, the adventure has originally six chapters and chapter one uh, the killer's dance that's you know leading up to the uh, ritual in Pagodin's mansion we spent, you know, what, 12 episodes on chapter one. Mm. And then, you know, we spent the other 12 or so we're spending in uh, what's chapter two, which is going to Frankfurt Under Order, and then The Dark Dreams, uh, mm. which is then uh, chapter three. But then we have chapter four, five, six. Um, I whip out like, dunk, dunk, dunk. Um, like, Gemeinsche Gemeinschaft is chapter four. Yeah. Uh, that was a session. So that's two episodes. <laughs> you could spend a lot more time in that chapter but and, and similarly chapter five which is mother russia um you have the air base you have the missile base um you have slava um also those went very quickly because i felt that w- where we had gotten in the story things had escalated so much that all of a sudden you guys going around on the streets of you know moscow <laughs> uh, arranging supplies or like talking to random people that it would sort of I don't know. Take take something away from the narrative in a way. Mm. Do you guys? Know I think that's a you... very good ex- a good example of the difference between what we're doing with our narrative podcast and if you were actually playing with friends, especially if there's like well, more of us, because then it feels like oh, of course you'd want to have a few sessions in Russia, having some you know, with, especially with four characters as well. You want everyone to have equal screen time, so there will just be more stuff to do as opposed to the two of us who got a lot of time. Do, do, do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah, definitely, because you would want mm. to follow up on everybody else's story as well. Yeah, mm. that makes mm. sense. The only thing I thought about it was, for some reason, I was thinking about every uh, everyone who's listening to this as a sort of nostalgic thing, having uh, uh, lived through the adventure myself, uh, themselves. Uh, I, I, was, I was mostly just worried that they would think that it, it was rushed rather than about myself. I didn't mind at all. I just, I, I really just enjoyed the ride, and I was kind of amazed how the tempo increased. But it didn't feel. It, it felt like it fit, sort, sort of. You know, it's just things getting done one by one. What I didn't expect was the ending to come so quickly. I was expecting like, okay, so it's this and this and this up to the first one. Uh, the first incarnate that is and then this and this up to the second and then uh, this and this and this up to the third but when he just said like that or in the last session that you said like oh this might be our last session I'm like and yeah, I, I, Craig you had that reaction too I think it's like what uh, but uh, what uh, what <laughs> <laughs> but it's just it's, you know but not in a too, like because on one hand then I loved it I was like oh cause it, because then the plot really it felt like a film you yeah. know in the film you don't spend two hours on the ending the film's like they go to Mordor throw the ring in it takes them like 20 minutes <laughs> you know yeah but yeah. then also it's like it could also be like it could also be more realistic because it doesn't have I mean just because it's set up in one way it doesn't mean that it 
would I mean realistically be like that that okay you find two then it's gonna take just as long to find the third uh, instead I mean if two had been destroyed that would give all the more reason for the third one to care a lot about us and perhaps finding us themselves hmm. yeah, I mean that, that's exactly so what last, happens yeah that's exactly what's what the happens. La- the last chapter is um, Leningrad, yes? The, the last chapter is called Back to Hell, and it, it is, yeah, Leningrad. And it's by far the shortest chapter, actually. So if you look at what's in there, I didn't skip uh, anything uh, at all, actually. It's, uh, you, hmm. you come to uh, the Black Cathedral. What's supposed to happen in the original is that um, you, after you have destroyed the missile base, you are in a hospital, you know, being taken care of from, you know, all your wounds that you take care, uh, you've incurred over there. And then Dimi Nesterov, the, the icon painter, shows up in your room and says, hey, I'm finished, let's go. And together huh. with, uh, with uh, the KGB uh, lictor, the Zoya Selivanova, you end up then going to, to Leningrad. So I made some changes there in, in regards to uh, cutting between the chapters. So I, I didn't really want to have, okay, now there's di- downtime here. Rather it was, okay, you were in a missile base and because you have destroyed the second incarnate now the third one has des- decided that okay now we have to go uh, it doesn't matter if we're yeah. gonna like it, we can't be sure that this is gonna succeed now but if we don't go right now uh, we might not get another chance so the plan is initiated and uh, you're moved directly there basically yeah uh, with the black madonna <laughs> mm, yeah and i definitely felt the description in that chat was absolutely amazing but I felt it was there for description because I was a bit like, oh, I-, I want to run around the furnace and try and save people. Like, you could do that, but it seems a bit pointless. Like, okay, <laughs> you try and save some of the people jumping in the furnace, but there's thousands. <laughs> oh, and, and that's another one, uh, actually. Uh. The, uh, that is actually not um, part of the Black Madonna. That's part of something that I uh, created myself, actually. This The idea of this incinerator. It's supposed to represent Inferno, this uh, sort of basically hell uh, um, dimension, you can say. Um, mm. So it's, it's just I, I thought of the imagery from... I mean, I was thinking about concentration camps, you know, what are things that are connected, you know, connecting Russia and Germany, yeah. um, and tried to do something with that. And then since we had done that previously, it was something that you saw when you had the car accident. I thought, well, hey, why not come back to that again? Because that was, you know, mm. a very dark time for your characters. Yeah. Why not come back to that and then, you know, have you be actually now trapped here and then meet up with Vova there and then you, you, you end up finding your way thanks to the children. Uh, you end up finding a way to Kalenko's palace. Awesome. Awesome. All right, I, I, I'll tell you what, I'll save a few more things for the actual ending bit. So, uh, In terms of, though, going back to the topic of the journey, I felt it was really good. Like, I felt you had a really good mystery element. You had to, people who wanted to get you, you want to get them. That's a nice, easy-to-play-with trope. And then you had the try and, you know, stop the bad guys doing something bad. For a bit of world hopping, and I thought that was all a very, you know, very good, realistic adventure, you know. Mm. No, that's really, <laughs> it's really great here, and you know, you have yeah. to really credit uh, uh, Gunilan Mikal who who uh, yeah. made the Black Madonna. It's, uh, I mean, that's, I really like how it's sort of taking place in in, in many different parts of the world, you know, diverse yeah. environments, and and that it is sort of ramping up and escalating and and becoming. Uh, more and more serious and and uh, that there are twists in the story uh, something I really uh, enjoy quite a bit w- what about you Yammer? how how did you feel about what sorry but, we were yeah doing... the, the journey the journey through yeah. uh, well the whole thing um, it felt very realistic <laughs> with all its weirdness it, with the, how the character reacts to the things and the things that we have to do and the places that we have to go to, uh, I just I just loved doing that. You know, taking on the journey, meeting all the people, and then tying it together with our per, our personal uh, pasts. It was so cool. I I I was looking back a bit at our our, our conversations back in May. When we like were constructing these characters, it's amazing that it. Uh, when, when did we actually start? Was it in May that we started this? 
I think, yeah, it was like end of May. I think we had our first. Could it have been end of yeah. May that we had our first session, or was it in June? Is around. Cause I, it may be the end of May. Yeah, it may have been yeah. end, end of May, and then we did a f- few more in June, and then we had a, a, a bit of a summer break. Yeah. So right before the summer break, we finished uh, episode twelve. We finished the ritual, uh, and then when we came back is 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 when you then ended up in the safe house. And this is, I think, one uh, more reason why I chose to make that yeah. uh, that that sort of jump there. Because there'd been so much physical time actually uh, yeah, passed. Yeah, for us as well. Yeah, for you guys. So exactly. rather than start up at the mansion, let's start up somewhere else and, yeah. and look back yeah. at that. Um, exactly. And what happened there at the mansion? He yeah. asks. <laughs> uh, it seems like we got a lot of uh, you know positive feedback on on that thing. So people seem to to like what we did with it. So I was mm. I was positively yeah. surprised by that. I was a bit worried to be honest because it was something that I had never tried before. Certainly, so. But um, going back to something you said here, uh, Janmar, you, you talked about sort of the people that you met. If you look at back yeah. at, at, like, what would be the most memorable NPC? Like, what was the most memorable character that you met during the journey? The one that maybe remains with you still today? <laughs> well, I mean, there were characters that we created together as well. If you take, like, the acquaintances of our characters as uh, uh, Tommy, for example, that is just Bjorn's friend. <laughs> I just really like him. <laughs> what what happened to him in the end? I wonder. What happened? That's what a good question. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, he can be a, the role, ca- the, the the character for for another <laughs> another game. We we'll have to play. <laughs> Maybe he can just be the, the the one that appears in all of our different campaigns. Maybe he'll show up. Yeah, in, yeah. Tommy in, comes yeah. back. I would love that. That was so great. <laughs> and how you uh, how you sort of just. After I, I laid the basis for him, like, and, or we just really uh, brainstormed about him together. It was just so much fun, and and the episodes that he had that were like so strange and so weird, and you filled them with references to other stuff. Uh, but then comes the the really caring and friendly ap- episode where. Uh, they just watch turtles together and then they watch the whole video stores films together and he really cares for uh barricard or Bjorn. um and i find it uh, uh it was quite touching actually i really liked how that that meeting ended up and you know he gives you a hug and then you're you're sort of crying against him and i, I thought yeah. that was really that was really touching that was yeah. mm, that was really something so so tommy is someone who stands out to you then I, can, um, what about you, uh, Craig? Any, any mm. memorable characters from the journey for you? So, all right. So let's let's divide it. Let's go first of all with the actual ones that were part of the adventure. Uh, you know what? In the end, Doctor Richter, he helped me out, didn't he? Uh, he helped me out. Dr. I was very Richter. dismissive of him <laughs> as a character, <laughs> if you remember. And then it was like he ended up being the only ally I had at the end. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I liked the lady in the bookstore as well. I like, yeah. Oh, yeah, she was so cool. Mm. The one who never blinked. Never blinked. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, but Richter, yeah. I want before you go on there. Yeah, I, I, he was. Uh, I mean, he was like so clinical, you know. So sort of, uh, 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 what would you call it? Like complete apathy. <laughs> He's like just into his studies of of us, you know. But at the same time, he helps us out for his own ends, of course. But I really liked him, and uh, I also liked the twist there when when Bjorn loses his stability and he says things that he actually probably isn't saying, but it kind of fits together. Like, how many people are you going to kill before you kill yourself? Or what he says, yeah. uh, I also was quite interested in the whole uh, pagodan aspect of the story. You know, all the stuff about the orphanage and his children and the mansion. Yeah. It was very... Because I remember thinking at the time, we'd done a lot of investigating. And I thought, oh, you know what? That's probably, you know, Kramer and Philip. Philip Kramer and um, well, Sasha Picard and everything. Uh, that that was... And, and Magda, that was the story, right? And then suddenly you were like, no, no, no. Let's let's, let's, let's for a moment tell you all about this orphanage and these children. This And how it all be... And I was like, ah, oh, this is really interesting. Like, yeah. Um... And I felt it was a shame we didn't... Again, like, there were quite a few cool antagonists. It just was a shame we couldn't speak with them more because, as you said, why would they? Like, you know, especially, like, the yeah. guy who led the, the mineshaft. 
Mm. Who was he? Because he he kind of he was the he was the most sort of like. Um, it's Gemeinschaft, Ooh, I'm actually... It's not the Mineshaft. <laughs> I, I can't remember. Gemeinschaft, the Gemeinschaft, it's Gemeinschaft. Uh, Ernst uh, Vogel, the guy who walked around in an SS uh, uniform. Yeah. 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 And he had oh, all yeah. this thing where he was like, oh, you think you know who you're working for? Who am I working for? And now we know. At the time, I just assumed he was another demon of Chigidiel. I was like, oh, no, he was something else for someone else. Yeah, so he yeah. actually think- comes from Chigidiel's uh, realm. He used to be a servant of Chigidiel, but he's sort of moved on um, on his own. So he thinks actually that Chigidiel is out to has come to get him now. So when he sees you with uh, Chigidiel's mark, he's like, "Oh shit, these guys are here for me. Uh, I got to do something about this." See, um, see, maybe you can do this too, uh, Karma. I mean, after all the uh, well, uh, we'll leave that. We'll leave. Yeah, we'll we'll discuss that at the end. But that's definitely <laughs> something I was thinking of. Um, but um, uh, ooh. Harkham. Mr. Harkham. Ah, um, yeah. I really wish we'd seen a bit more of him. I thought he was very... Uh, I, I won't lie. He kind of transcended to the anime level <laughs> with his uh, time and space ability. I was thinking more like heroes. Hero, you know. Uh, oh, oh, I like that, yeah. And and just the way he was so smug when he got off that first time. And I was like, who is this guy? Oh, he's cool. Yeah. And again, I felt it was a shame because I'd love to have had a monologue with him at the end, but... I'll be honest, at the time, I just wanted to kill kill him. <laughs> I didn't Slice think him. he would die, but I think it was a really worthy death, the way he portrayed it. Yeah, no, and, and it was, like, he wasn't supposed... Like, he's If he would have tried to do that anywhere else, it wouldn't have happened. Like, he would have just been able to pop out of existence. But as, as you may remember from the end there, he says, like, why yeah. can't I get out of here? Why can I not go leave this place? And it's because, you know, you are in Inferno, you are in, in a place where... Basically, no one can get out of uh, until this fight plays out. Um, and uh, that's why he, he meets that uh, end there. But, but he's, you know, he's super, super, super powerful. And uh, mm. he's sort of referenced to throughout the story. He's referenced to in the Slavic Association. And then you actually end up meeting him in in Slavum. But he, he mm. was one of these characters for me that I, I thought was quite maybe challenging to work with because... There's not so much mention about him, really, other than that he is trying to get gain power through this. And uh, th- there is actually one part that uh, we didn't end up doing, but it's actually possible to meet his, like, to go to his base in Russia, where he has his novices and, you know, he's performing sacrifices and all that. Uh, it's actually possible to go there to visit that place, but there's nothing really there. Um, there's nothing central to the, the story at all. There's no reason really to go there other than right. flavor. Um, mm. So that was one of many reasons why we didn't end up going there. But he's someone that I think, yeah, maybe we could have done more with because it seemed like he really, yeah, he, you made a connection with him. And, and uh, I well, really it's like interesting posing another British just... character against uh, yours and you could have yeah. like a, a British off. <laughs> it's interesting because it's interesting because, like you said, he seemed really cool. But it's interesting that now you're telling us, ah, he actually almost was quite superfluous to the story. And I agree, that's always a problem because, yeah, why would he? That doesn't sound like there was any reason we would have gone there, unless, unless maybe he could have captured us and taken us there. That's the only reason I would, because otherwise, why would we go to his base? But at the same time, I really like characters that are really, really cool, but don't really play a part. You know. That hmm. is for uh, if if you read the uh, Song of Ice and Fire series, they're just it's teeming with characters uh, that you really love, and they get killed off here and there, and it's like I I I just I just love it. I mean, he he didn't have he, you just popped up here and there, and it's nice to speculate about, you know, because I was I was thinking about that when we were at the essay, like who the hell is Nigel Harkham and why did he disappear? Then I just uh, completely forgot it afterwards, and mm. or actually, it mm. didn't. I didn't forget it. I it was still obviously there because I really reacted to it when I pro- suddenly the name popped up in the you files. Did. Also, I think Ivan was cool. You know, he was a cool, like weird angel, not really an angel thing. <laughs> yeah, it, he, and he's supposed to like always try to keep everything. Um, try to make it believable try to make it about god and about angels and about like the classic like biblical yeah uh you know <clears throat> canon rather than involving what's actually you know what's actually going on um mm. yeah uh, so uh yeah he's he was also uh, a fun one to, to portray i thought you had fun with him you like yeah. you, you had your ivan voice 
<laughs> that was fun. I, I also, I really liked Kalenko and that meeting because there was so much anticipation, I feel, before meeting him. But then he just, he's just this man who did what he thought he had to do for his family. And it's like, yeah, it's kind of unfortunate how things went, but I just had to do this. And of course, in the end, I had to sacrifice my family. Uh, and mm. you know it's it's very anti-climactic, very sort of human, uh, and I sort of liked that. But uh, yeah, I wanted to make him into sort of a weak, broken man rather than some like mustache twirling uh, super villain kind of uh, thing. He's, yeah, he's supposed to survive until the end, and and is actually supposed to be like torn away by the. By the three women, the Nephrites, they will oh, pull him away, nice. and they will torture him, and they will finally give him, you know, they will punish him for what he did. Yeah. But you killed him uh, in the dream. I mean, you killed him in the state of the dream where uh, you could die. I think I said that also that you feel like if you if you were to die here, you would actually die because mm. Chigidil had made the dream lethal essentially. <laughs> um, and when you killed him there, I went, okay, well, if you kill him here, yeah, he needs to die. That's that's just <laughs> how it works. So he's dead when you find I'd, him. I'd, and now you bring it up. Of course, the Nephrites. They were, they were, they were a really good element of the, as you said, the mystery of cults, because we never really knew what they were. And even when we did, we still didn't really like. Well, I, I don't know what are they? Or yeah. like they were like monsters, but they weren't. And, and they were tied to Tegidiel, but it's like, yeah, oh, it's like we, it's, it's like we should be on the same side because we're both against. Uh, Kalenko and what he did and mm. they were ultimately sacrificed so it feels like they would be on our side but they just couldn't be because mm. they, uh, they that's not their, that's not that their nature they're, they're not allowed to basically um, to go against their master but they're, they're trying yeah. everything else that they can because of course that they are in the state that they are in is because of Kalenko and because of Chigidil they were you know sacrificed and tortured horribly and, and uh, are now slaves and they don't mm. they don't like that, but they have to they have a role to play. But then they're trying yeah. to sort of cheat a little bit, and they're trying to help. Uh, but um, you know, if uh, if you would have like gone into combat with them and lost, for example, then yeah, they would have they would have pulled you into hell and tortured you because that's what they're supposed to do. Yeah. What what did you call them again? Uh, they're called Nephrites. What does that mean? Nephrite. I don't actually know the the origin of the word, but uh, basically there's some kind of uh, mm, tor torturing spirit of some kind that's uh, they they usually appear when there's a lot of pain and suffering um, and, and people who are suffering um, a lot uh, and who are you know torturing others, for example, then then they can sort of appear there and uh, their role is basically then to to take these souls to to a purgatory and to to, to torture them um, there and mm. uh, yeah that's uh, that's what they did with the the Russians they you remember they after yeah. the incarnates had been released yeah. they took them away actually and uh, the Russians hooks. yeah with meat hooks and they were still alive impossibly right oh, shit. Um, so they were actually taking them to their their own personal purgatories to be tortured forever Lovely. they had horrible lives those three yeah, yeah in, it's funny how in the end it almost felt like, oh, they weren't maybe the bad guys after all. I mean, they were, but maybe they weren't, because... No, they were, their destiny was just chosen for them, and they mm. were... Yeah, I think, yeah, were. I don't remember who it is that refers to them, but if someone uh, is referring to them actually as the innocents, uh, I don't know if it was Chizenko or who, uh, uh. who it is, but, but yeah, because, yes, they do horrible things, but it's not... It's not fully chosen by them necessarily. It is the innocence. I like that. So, oh, and yeah, I'll conclude the question. NPCs, of course, Jenkins, <laughs> of course, uh, of Jenkins. course. And he was amazing. I loved him. And ah, oh, the I'll talk about it more when we finish. But uh, yeah, for th part of that ending, one of my last options for last words would have been reaching out to Jenkins, saying, "Come back." Come back. I'm sorry. Come back. Hmm. That would uh, never tell us who he was. Who even whose <laughs> side he was on. That's the one thing. I, that's the one thing. I can live with not knowing what he really was. Uh. But was he a servant of Astaroth? Was he a servant of the, the, the angel things? Like, was, what was his purpose to make me do all those things? What do you, what do you think? Not. 
I, I want to think he wasn't evil. The way I, I felt maybe he was sort of like... Maybe he was some aspect of the Black Madonna trying to guide me to doing the right thing and to become the vessel of the Black Madonna and achieve that destiny. And then when I had done that, unfortunately, I was no longer important. That... <laughs> Maybe, maybe. Or maybe, maybe like it was like that. But then he he just well he he didn't have the power to keep you from your fate because you'd already mm. bound yourself to something else. Yes, yes, that's what I think. Hmm. I mean, part of me wonders as well. Like, well, actually, that's the thing again. We'll discuss in a minute. Like, Carver's fate was it avoidable? It might not have been. Um. But there we go. No, Jenkins. And I, I also, I love how, guys, I didn't expect that Jenkins. When mm. I first started with a cat called Jenkins, it was just a, you know, like, oh, it's my cat called Jenkins. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, Jenkins also developed quite a lot for me as well. I mean, originally I, I had him, one of the things I wrote in was that, you know, he can, he can appear uh, pretty much wherever you need him so that, you know, we don't have to always justify why the cat is there uh, yeah. because then it becomes sort of a burden. But it's needed, of course, for you um, in order to be able to recover stability. That's sort of the game mm. mechanical purpose of Jenkins mm. and the game mechanical purpose of Tommy. Uh, it's, it's, yeah. Mm. But um, but then I think he grew uh, so much for me as well. And, and uh, especially, I think, it really escalated with uh, um, after you're back from Pagodian's mansion and he's sitting there and it's like, what, what is he really like is, is he is he controlling the story mm. here what's what's going on <laughs> yeah maybe he and was like the game also, master i mean he, <laughs> he, he, could, he, he could was be. like he could be me <laughs> it felt like you were almost about to lose him for a while uh i'm not talking about uh, when you had the vision of killing him but uh, when he asked you when you had killed someone when you when you first in, unintentionally killed that man and he sort of was staring at you, asking if you could say it like that, if you regret what you had done. Mm. And you did regret it, oh, honestly. And then he said, okay, then I forgive you. So that makes me think that he was definitely uh, Jesus. I mean, he was <laughs> definitely not evil. It was something I tried to play the whole way through as well, that even towards the end, when I became more kill-happy, I still really actually didn't want to kill anyone ever. Not really. But it all just blurred as I became more... Of something else. Hmm. Yeah, and I, I think, I mean, like we talked about for Bjorn as well, he he really, really didn't want to kill innocent people. That was what he was haunted by most. And that was, uh, I think, from killing Bjorn, that really, that I think that was one of his, uh, 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 his disadvantage. No, not disadvantage, but uh, dark secret. It's the guilty of crime. It's the, the killing Bjorn and uh, stealing, stealing his identity. Mm. That was yeah. like what is... Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I mean, if... Um, if we didn't think a little bit here now um, about the campaign as a whole here and we look at, like, a highlight, is there any one moment? Because I think the re one I would like to connect with here is a moment that I really liked uh, as, as a game master was when... when you played out uh, how you killed Bjorn, you know, the cyanide capsules and everything. That was something that you had created without really me knowing about it, and I just really, really love that. But uh, uh. was there any, what were your sort of personal highlights of of this? What was the, the moments that really stood out to you? I'm glad you liked that. Uh, well... To me, I mean, I'm currently listening to the edited episodes. My my favorite episode is the one that is out now. It's episode 18. Uh, uh, just uh, when they're losing it. It was so, so much fun and so weird to play because it, it kept me as a player sort of balancing between laughter and frustration too i mean i was i was honest laughs you know that just came there like as uh, so he's looking in the trunk and what's there oh it's your dead driver it's like <laughs> it's like uh, <laughs> of course it is <laughs> it was of course yeah oh it was so great i love that episode it's it's just so yeah. good and there was a lot of people who commented about that as well i mean i, I sometimes uh 
when I was uh, originally putting t together some of the ideas for uh, for these insanity effects, I was worried that some of them might come off as being a bit too much. But it seems like we it seems like we hit just the right spot, and I think your um, reaction to them was really what was sold it and, and made it uh, really made it work. Which uh, yeah, really really nicely done. <laughs> and Kave comes back to me standing kicking the uh, vending, vending machine. machine. <laughs> Yeah, your favorite this. carver yeah. moment like, so yeah angry. yeah 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 the, the as i like to call it the carver on his own i'm still yeah. <laughs> yeah what about you uh craig any uh oh. highlight moments for you oh so many so many um okay so let's go with bjorn first so B when he told me about himself a very short scene in a way i suppose mm. really wasn't it and very quite slight but i just felt that was very oh huh. Really, because it was the way it was such a big deal for Bjorn, and it was, but... Oh, I don't know. Did you know what I mean? It was just, it was just nice. It was like, ah, oh, cool. Um, being more dramatic, Bjorn's moment with his kid in the uh, in the nightmare, I thought that was just, oh my gosh. <sighs> oh my gosh. He's dra like, no, and I was trying to help, but we couldn't help. And, and it was just like, no, Bjorn, Bjorn. Ah, <laughs> uh, mm. yeah. Mm. The horror. Yeah. That was a great moment of Bjorn's character there. Uh, and then going to more cool Bjorn. Uh, of course, the jet fight. Of course. <laughs> Come on. That, was just a bit... that that couldn't have happened without Bjorn. I wasn't going to fly a plane like that. <laughs> yeah, it was insane. It's like, yeah, and, and succeeding on the rolls, actually getting out of the base so it actually became something could it, because we could have just gotten sort of shot down there. Yeah, mm. you could have. And, uh, and and if anything, lots of stuff with Bjorn towards the end. I kind of felt very much that we both got a different side of the epicness of the ending. I yeah. got the more spiritual, like, chosen one type thing. Yeah. But everything to do with the KGB, every military thing, what was I, I... Apart from summoning demons, I was just sort of sitting in the background laughing madly because why would I be able to do anything? <laughs> it was Bjorn who was leading the men and getting them to strike teams and doing some assassination stuff. And it was very much the, the, the transformation, if you will, from his playboy persona at the start to who he really was, the KGB soldier. Captain. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And all of that, just uh, awesome, awesome. And, you know, Volva, Volva, for, for every Volva and Bjorn scene was very mysterious yeah. Very interesting. I never was quite sure if Volvo was something supernatural towards the end yeah. there. <laughs> How did you react to when suddenly... When did you realise that there was sort of a romantic interest? I'll be honest with you, I don't think... I don't think Carver... I don't think Carver did at all. Uh, no. Because I don't think he was... Initially, you were quite subtle about it, and then when you actually were open about it, I was completely mad. <laughs> <laughs> I was just well, like, oh, they're kissing, great, uh, whatever, uh, the world's <laughs> ending, you know. <laughs> what about you? What about you, yourself? When did you... Okay, did... yeah, so that was you, for me. I mean, did you pick up on that? I mean, did you pick up on Oh, that? yeah, so. yeah. Oh, I think I did, I think I... Well, I also thought you were romantically involved with that guy in the club, or the girl, like, the guy oh, slash girl that, in the, the club. Oh, okay, yeah. okay, interesting. Yeah. Anna. I thought there was something there, oh, okay. and uh, but yeah, no, and then yeah, towards the end, of course. But it was a nice development, actually. It was it was good. I think we, yeah, had lots of fun. Uh, we were trying to figure out because that was one of my disadvantages, or my only disadvantage was Nemesis, someone who is hunting you for something you have done, and that was Vova. Uh, so ah. initially, it was just like okay, so we must think of something that is so personally horrible that they would make the efforts of hunting him after his desertion from the KGB and it's just it's not that's not enough just deserting you know and it's not inten intensive enough we need something that is completely emotional so we built up the backstory of I think I, I, I think it was uh, Matthias that finally came with the idea of him ha being uh, sort of a, a romantic interest or something like that. Mm. Um, mm. That's um, really cool. Yeah, yeah and I was yeah, like, okay, this is... I was really reacting strongly to this. Okay, this is strong enough. If if they were actually romantically involved, but they, of course, couldn't be that openly because of uh, how Russia was during that time, how the world was during that time, but m most of all Russia, and they're both being KGB agents, uh, they need full cover, they need... Uh, to have his pretend families and everything, and in the end, Bjorn just chooses his uh, his family's safety 
and his own safety over Vova and puts him at risk and exposes him uh, while Vova wanted the opposite. He wanted them to sort of stop living a lie and actually become a couple, whatever the cost. But Bjorn really lets him down there and he thus leaving Vova exposed and everything, even though he has sort of exposed himself. So that co- sort of made it strong enough. No, I, and I think that it, that um, yeah, I, I really liked what we what we built there with with Vova, and I really I, I felt like it was it was important that we we built something that really had, as you said, that really resounded emotionally and that felt that felt real. And it was also another it was also something I wanted to explore. You know, you having having the character that you have and actually have him, yeah, actually have a, a romantic interest like that and, and, and having a person that, that he actually does love but that he has yeah. has really let down um, and now has actually you know gets towards the end a chance to to get forgiveness from um, and uh, then having uh, we'll come to the end again but like also then having having it end the way that it did uh, and not going with the typical tropes when it comes to these kinds of, of relationships but actually ending on that note uh, that was something that um I was really happy that we were able to build that up and uh, it was going to be really exciting yeah. to see how people respond to that uh, because it's not yeah. I, I, I don't think it's very common um, it's co- not conventional no no but well, it's, it's interesting it's interesting it's very interesting hmm. should we go yeah. to the, the the end there or, or is, there, is there any other highlights that you would like oh. to fill in oh what I wanted to and we, said, we, we don't start with Karma's Carver. highlights yet oh <laughs> yeah yeah that was all. That was all. What I loved about Bjorn. Okay, <laughs> go with Bjorn then. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, no, no I'll, 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 I'll be quick because it's like. Oh no, don't be. <laughs> every single thing you did with his flashbacks and his memories, just all yeah. of it. I just thought I loved it. because yeah. guys, the way I did it, I've, I've probably mentioned before, is I did want to give Matthias some stuff to give me. I didn't want to know what my flashbacks meant. I didn't want to know what the. Uh, mm. the the uh, the thing I was forgetting because I wanted to be able to react to it in a way oh. that was like oh my god yeah. and that's why things like the parents at the end even the oh. the initial reveal that I was adopted I was just like oh my god and and how it sneaks in with the dream sequence where you open the file but you don't get to read it uh, yes. because they're drawn out of it I loved that so much that was such a great moment yes oh. yes it was and obviously the Jenkins yeah as you said Jenkins asking did you regret that me like yes mm. the whole descent into uh, Isosha mm. was awesome that because was again really like cool. we almost I've almost asked Matt has to edit a bit of that because I in general real life was actually really thinking what do I say what do I say I don't know do I say yes do I say no oh I don't want to say yes but I have to say yes <laughs> and and should we add there what about the note because that's uh, not in the book. Yeah, podcast. go on then. Yeah, because I, I did that just so it wouldn't, so that it could be something again that came up as a surprise. But I, uh, I wrote a little note just as I was on the way to meet Bjorn and save him. I wrote him a little note being like, I don't know what's going to happen to me now. I'm Try and save me if you can, but don't. I, I, have, brought, I have it here if you want me to read yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, so this is what you wrote. Uh, Hold on to this. I wrote a letter for Bjorn to find under the car chair just before I started on the journey. So that would be the car of your your little Trabant then, uh, mm. just when you had made this pact. And what you wrote in the note was, Isosha is its name. Try one day to destroy it. I don't think I will be able to. I belong to its master now. I am sorry. Do not act now or read this aloud. I did it to save you. We can't stop this alone. If you have to kill me one day, please do. I don't think I will be the same. James Carver. Oh. <laughs> and that ended up being very, well, almost very true. Yeah. It's emotional for me, just reading it. I mean, him asking him to sort of kill him when he did it to save Bjorn, because how could he possibly do it when it's back in the real world? He doesn't have the ability to manipulate anything uh what what can he do on his own in in that particular situation when he knows that there are so many factions out to get us? He made this uh, pact out of desperation. I think it's beautiful, mm. really. I think it's really beautiful. Mm. Thank you. No, I thought that was an awesome moment, and and I felt it was a moment, Matthias. You could, you were planning. 
you were always planning the day. One day Carver's going to try and ask the evils for help, and I'll be ready. I'll be ready. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, definitely. So that's, if, in case anyone wonders, why Bjorn actually suddenly shifted the grenade launcher and, and destroyed Isosha when he saw him weakened. It was because mm. of that note of hoping that it would somehow set Carver free as well. <laughs> and for yeah. a moment, I actually forgot as a player, and that I felt was great because I thought it reflected my character. He was yeah. good. Yeah, he'd forgotten. He he didn't think. He no longer was thinking anymore yeah. of saving himself. He was slowly becoming more and more a uh, just a willing servant, yeah. if you will. And he was like, "Wait, what?" Yeah, I felt that too. Hope. And and when I sort of just pushed you aside to keep you out of mm. the uh, danger zone from the grenade launcher, it's just like it felt almost like you know uh, a fatherly instinct almost. Mm. <laughs> Uh, and I definitely, of course, really enjoyed the part just before that, that on a lighter note, yeah, Carver alone, as we'll call it, failing to break into a car, failing to get any help, no weapons, no nothing, and it was like, great, <laughs> <laughs> I can't do anything. <laughs> I love how that worked out when you're trying to break into the mm. car, because I was tr- sort of trying mm. to subtly say, uh, subtly say that, well, you know, you have, you know, you've forgotten the you know your, your the, the keys to your car you kind of know how to get into these but i think at the time you were just so panicked you're like oh i'm can take the mm. gun i'm gonna try and what is it smash the window and, and like try to yes. get this like and then yeah not okay roll that. for it <laughs> and not then you even fa- fail it completely yeah. and it's like yes. it, it just it felt it's, so ah it's such a lovely contrast useless. to what had happened before and and what would, what would then follow <laughs> Oh, you mean mm, well, uh, when we infiltrated the place and all that effectiveness that we yeah. went through? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And I think I'll then just finish on general notes, general, like, you know, not character-wise, but the campaign itself. Everything to do with the Black Madonna. Like, oh my gosh, it was so worth the wait. It was so awesome. Just like, what is the Black Madonna? Oh, it's this cool thing. And all the incarnate fights, because they were all different in yeah. the end. We yeah. had a proper one-on-one dream world boss fight. We had yeah. a more realistic, like, military base, like, attack. And finally, we had our, like, God versus God, a Godzilla ending. Mm-hmm. And, you know, taking into consideration, how, when you say one-on-one there, how much teamwork there was in all of those fights. You mm-hmm. know, for the first one there, you basically transforming uh, Bjorn into this... Uh, a- angelic being and they fought with blades you know trying to get past his chains you know this how how they act together there in such different ways you know him being boosted by you and then in the second one where you're being the one opening the portal and mm. then so that i could possibly finish the job like that it's like it's very it's so much in sync it's almost as if we'd planned it you know mm. yes actually I hadn't, it was all off the cuff, just like, that sounds like a good idea type stuff. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, you guys were definitely well synced. Uh, it was very, very nice to see. Uh, all the teamwork, I think, really throughout uh, throughout the campaign it was really excellent. And then you did, you know, butt heads with each other once in a while as well, and that made it also feel very realistic. So, uh, hmm. yeah, I really loved yeah. it. Although, shall we finish the, co- the, 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 the this, this question by moving on to yourself, Matthias? Like, what were your moments? Like yeah. you say, butt heads. What moments stood out as that? Because I know we did, but I just can't remember any specifically now. Well, there's a lot of uh, like uh, Bjorn hushing at Carver. Courage. <laughs> 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 yes, <that's true. laughs> holding up a hand. <laughs> oh, yeah, I hold up a hand. That's another one. Or, or uh, there's also Bjorn starting to like ask questions about how, how does this actually work? And Carver's just like, we don't have time. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, so <laughs> it doesn't matter in the end it's all a dream <laughs> yeah, yeah so I mean, there's a lot of uh, fun stuff like that and then uh, but but then there, there was also a lot of you know nice uh, nice times when they were just sort of hanging out together and uh, having breakfast together um, in the beginning there was a lot of like really pleasant times also that uh, yeah. I think worked worked to sort of cement the relationship that we then uh, built on throughout the campaign so yeah. yeah. Um, so th- there's definitely some moments there with the butting of heads that that I've certainly enjoyed. Um, then um, 
I mean, I, uh, as you mentioned here with the, the, the jet fight and the MiG-29s and everything like that, yeah, that was something that I had really built up to. And it's not really in the campaign. It's There are <laughs> MiG-29s at this airbase. And of course, if there's 12 MiG-29s in a tunnel, of course you need to use them, uh, is what I figured. <laughs> so that's mm. that would be the perfect way to escape uh, from the airbase. Uh, probably yeah. in a normal campaign, you probably end up taking a car or something like that, or the yeah. KGB can come and rescue you. But uh, I figured, hey, no. That's not what we're gonna do. We're gonna we're gonna have, you know, the guys get into MiG twenty nine, and we're gonna <laughs> go into we're gonna we're gonna see if we can. I was hoping that you would be able to escape the SAM uh, system, yeah. so that you could then get into Inferno. That Carver could open a portal to Inferno <laughs> and bring uh, Leskov with him. And a funny thing about Leskov, and I think maybe you heard him say it. He was saying. I can't be here again. Um, so Leskov's backstory uh, and one one reason why he's, or the reason why he's serving um, Strelkov is because he himself was actually, when he was flying his airplane, he was actually pulled into Inferno in the past and he actually got um, to meet, I think he met with Chigidil there or, or wow. was sort of in, uh, affected by that there so that he then has this ability, or has this chance to come back there and to <laughs> to face you there uh, above Inferno and I suppose I think we also had a little bit of Metropolis, a little bit of Stalingrad in there as well. Um, yeah. It was it was a really cool uh, scene that I uh, had really been waiting for uh, for a very long time, and it was so great that, uh, that we got to do it. And uh, I think the way you did it was was really mm. really quite something. Yeah, I mean, and it's not it's not like it's not completely incredible that he would have this experience as well because he is this universal soldier type, this Hamilton, you know, just. Yeah. Having done a bit of everything, uh, uh, but I mean, yeah, yeah. I'd only fly. Yeah, is there any other? Um, I'm before. sorry, I interrupted you. <laughs> so, what if he just fail on the first roll and run the plane into a wall? You know, could have oh. happened. Oh, that was on my mind the whole time. I was thinking, well, what would happen if we just crash this? The missiles they lock on, you get shot. Yeah, down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Then we would have had to to do something else there, but uh, but uh, it didn't happen, fortunately. Um, nope, and it was all. I mean. That's so nice with role-playing games. That okay, we do the roles and then we have to abide by them. It's yes. like you can't get away. No, exactly. So I mean, that was definitely something. And then early on as well, the the the, the fire episode with uh, Alexei, the the man with the swollen face, when he comes to your apartment yeah. and uh, the sort of the showdown there. Uh, I also oh yeah, with the machine killing rifle and that. Yeah, oh, that, that was, was also nice. a lot of fun. I don't know. I seem to gravitate towards these like uh, very violent scenes. Uh, personally, I don't really know why, but uh, but yeah, I, I did enjoy those a lot. Um, yeah. And, um, yeah. And then, as I said, yeah, the the scene that you created there with uh, the, the vision of, uh, of of the past of killing Bjorn that was that was certainly something. And uh, and also the end. And, and I guess that's what we will talk about now, right? The how it ended mm. because. Um, mm. Although, can I throw yeah. one silly question in here? One silly question. What was your favourite non-important NPC? <laughs> that is. Which one of the very silly, like, man on street? Oh, yeah, or, yeah, uh, yeah, right. Guy, the guy at the cafe who was like, why are you looking for this building? Like, you know, w- w- was there anyone who stood out for you there? I mean, I liked Erica Holler, the, the one in the mantra bookshop. Because uh, she's mm. she's just a name yeah. in the campaign, also she's also one one that I've put together myself. Um, she's in a wheelchair, she doesn't blink, um, and she makes these like kind of cryptic comments at the carver about like, oh, please come back alive. <laughs> and uh, she was she was a lot of fun to um, to portray. Uh, I really liked her. Yeah. I, I really liked Richter also. Uh, he's an important one, I suppose, but just the fact that he's supposed to be a little bit weird and like he starts talking about tarot cards and aliens and uh, and then you're like, what? What are you even talking about? And he's like, oh, forget about it. <laughs> that was, that was uh, kind of funny. Yeah, yeah, right. The yeah, lizard yeah. Men. Lizard like... men. Are you familiar with lizard men? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's like the... Uh, I, I bet you enjoyed tormenting us by playing this completely ap- uh, apathic, what do you say, apathetic... A woman who was in the reception of the clinic. <laughs> <laughs> well, Stella. Just sitting there knitting. It's Stella, yeah. It's like, <laughs> I tried to, at least three times, I tried to start conversations with her. And she's like, oh. In the end, like, just ignores me from the start. And, and who was your favorite, like, actual, like, antagonist then? Favorite antagonist? To play, yeah. To play. Or play with, yeah. Hmm. hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. I mean, I think that the Dream Incarnate 
um, I liked him quite a lot because I really wanted to make him very like really messed up. I mean, basically he said, um, "I'm going to keep you alive and I'm going to make you into children and I'm going to enjoy myself." And it's like uh, just really making him as dark as possible. Um, uh, yeah, that, that, that was that was up. also. Uh, I mean, it's it's interesting to play those kinds of uh, messed up characters. Um, yeah, you know, because you that, that's one of the things that you can do in a, a role playing game uh, that you will never be able to do in real life. So. I, I did enjoy him quite a bit, and I think the way that he went out, that he really went out with a fight, and then the way that I should... That, that's an, another favorite moment, is in the orphanage, when you finally kill him. You just push the knife into his eye. Um, that was amazing. Mm. Oh, yeah. Do you remember that? <laughs> and then go to your parents. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, that was good. That was good. So much stuff. That, those dreams were really good. There was some awesome stuff that happened there. Yeah. <laughs> And I really wanted to put in some light there as well with uh, with meeting your parents. And then I, you know, because normally Guld is, is, you know, all like just bad stuff after bad, like bad thing after bad thing happens. Mm. You get tortured. Things are looking bleak. <laughs> but then here it's like you get to see your parents and they they tell you that they love you and, and they will be your strength and, and all these things. And sort of a, a nice then kind of light moment. And then after that, it just go straight to hell right afterwards yeah, yeah no I, I i feel that's a good i think that's absolutely fine because if anything it makes the darkest tragedy more tragic like bjorn's phone call to um to the wife there mm. like for a moment there was a bit of like it, they are the, they are fine they were fine but he'll never see them again and i was like oh oh no <laughs> yeah and it's interesting too because i as i said now the the, the wife and the child were really just a cover I mean, they were, for him, he, he was a KGB agent who was actually in love with another man, and he needed a family, so he started a family, uh, but still, it's his daughter, and he probably had some sort of relation to his wife, but, you know, it's, it's, it's nice how it's tied in anyway. And I think... Uh, what you said there about light and dark, uh, and also what you mentioned about that you like these gory um, fights and stuff. I think all in all through this adventure it was quite well balanced between both light and dark and both exploration and fights. You know, it was just... Yeah, and, and we had our moments, like I said, we had our little moments of in-character humour. That's what I like. It wasn't fun. But Carver failing wasn't funny because I was going, Haha, oh no, I felt it's because actually I was really frustrated and angry in character and it came across as funny. <laughs> yeah. And the same with Bjorn and that receptionist. And also, Bjorn's like crazy psychedelic dream. <laughs> it was oh, funny yeah. because he was having a crazy dream, but it was still in character. Like, whoa, man, machine killing rifle. <laughs> oh, yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, or, or uh, another fun one was... Um when you called uh, your police contact uh, that did not owe you any favors anymore <laughs> and just wouldn't help you at all and you were so frustrated <laughs> don't <Yeah>. call again <laughs> so, uh, and, uh, yeah we got some comments on, on that as well when we, uh, we released it in the, uh, the, in the in the raw on Patreon as well people uh, did enjoy uh, that like it, it could, you could re they could really hear the, the uh, like real frustration that Craig had mm. at, yeah. at that, at that situation uh, so was really nice grasping at straws then oh mm. it's like <laughs> it was great it was really great all right well what about the end then let's let's move there um yeah. how, how do you feel about it where it left your character did, did it feel justified did it feel emotional did it feel like a, a worthy end to this long journey that we've been on you go first craig you've seen the most frustrated oh well well i i am oh i have many mixed feelings i think looking back on it now i think it was probably perfect yeah. I think it was probably pitch perfect. Yeah. It just, I'm hmm. so I think because I think for me the big thing was the last thing you said, and I have to ask like, had you ever really planned what my uh, forbidden memory was? <laughs> <laughs> because it seemed, I was like because the, the way that you delivered it there seemed perfect. Like there you go, the last thing you say, yeah, you remember, you did that. Oh fuck, the end. <laughs> 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 and and that made me feel that yeah maybe the whole the entire story maybe I was doomed from the start. Yeah, 
yeah, I really liked how that how that turned out and how we got that in there at the end. It, it does, of course, not mean that you know that your character didn't have a chance to to change anything or, or anything like that. But he he did make some choices that certainly cemented uh, his fate. Um, so uh, yeah, I really liked how you brought it in there in that final scene. Also, that it wasn't something that I had to like you know give to you, but rather it came it came as a question from you. And and uh, yeah, really like that. And and uh, and again, I felt it was one of those things where my reactions just felt great because like, I didn't because you know you could have gone with that. I could have gone with the whole oh no, oh no. But I thought, what's the point? All I want to know is the truth. It's all I ever wanted to know, in a way. And I got it. It was. So and as you said, mm-hmm. as we discussed, uh, like I, because for a moment I did actually think, um, oh no, the whole mind and soul thing, like. I was going to be trapped in like a purgatide and just have to go around killing people forever. But then you did remind me that, oh no, actually, you are now more like uh, those guys you met, the servants. Vogel. Yeah, yeah like Vogel. You're you're like Vogel in the Gemeinschaft, Gemeinschaft uh, of Razid. So you are very much, uh, you're very much in, in control of things. Of course, you do have a, <clears throat> you do have a master um, that you, you serve, but uh, you have been turned into one of those beings, which is, uh, you know, Maybe NPC Carver can come back in the future. <laughs> perhaps, perhaps. I mean, it was also, you know, one of the last lines was about, you know, Jenkins walks away and, and then, you know, your humanity is basically taken away. You still have your, you know, your, your mind and your soul, but you're, you know, there's very little of your, your human part otherwise left. Uh, and there was something, mm-hmm. there was something interesting about that because cult is dealing a lot with those kinds of themes about it's a very humanocentric game it's very focused on on the the importance of 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 being human and yeah so it felt like a a nice place to sort of take it there uh towards the end and to also make it sufficiently sort of dark in the end just so that it it Mm. sticks to the overall theme of the game i I felt it was classic trope. It was classic how the stories of, you know, I was the academic, I went too far, I kept saying there was a price, I paid the price. But, you know, had to happen. Uh, mm. And like I said, if the only things I would have changed now, I think about it, it, was, it would have been, I, I think I would have liked to have said Jenkins come back. But, you know, Jenkins. Uh, yeah. Jenkins, I just, because I think that for me, that would have been, in my mind at the time, that was my final breaking point if you will it was just knowing that Jenkins was gone mm. I, I so much liked the final exchange between uh, uh, Carver and uh, and uh, Bjorn as well as like, like mm. they just they just get violently separated and Bjorn is I mean uh, Carver is just shouting over the the chasm that we did it we did we freed the children and like this this shout of success victory in, mm. in the chaos where uh, he is just being pulled from his you know brother in arms and and Bjorn is almost is hanging on to his life you know and mm. uh, it's just because it was it was very much supposed to me be because I felt we'd done what we needed to do, and I wanted you to live. I wanted Bjorn. I, I, I thought whatever happens to me now, it probably isn't good. But Bjorn, maybe Bjorn's gonna get out of this. Yeah. And 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 yeah. And I what what I said I think was like because I wanted to say my prepared speech, you know, which obviously didn't get to happen because of all the chaos. But my prepared like downtown speech was that they said about the cycle. Oh, we need to stop the cycle, but it has to for the children suffering the cycle of suffering so I was like yeah. we ended the cycle of suffering yeah. that's what we did yeah and I don't regret that decision even if maybe it was the wrong decision it's like uh, um, to me it was probably the most unexpected thing that could happen would be that the two heroes got separated you know mm. it was like mm. whatever happens whether or not they can go back to reality they probably will end up in the same place, sort of. But then that they just ended up in completely different places after that exchange just makes it... I don't know, it was unexpected and it made it very... Mm. It made it both, both thoughtful and uh, a bit emotional. Yeah. Right? Uh, I loved the, the message as well from Jennifer. 
like the actual last thing, right. the whole thing, just like she called back. Right. She called back. Yeah. <laughs> and um, and um, and then and then. Oh gosh. Oh no, I had a point. It's gone. It's left. Oh wait, was it you calling her initially? Remember, I, I had a call. I tried to call her before we finally, right. in a way, did our final right. run. Uh, and she wasn't there. I left a message. And I, I don't, no, did I leave a message? You did. I yeah. did. I did. And it was basically like, it's fine. I hope you're okay. Don't forget about me. It's fine. Don't call back. But yeah, I'll get it if you don't call back. Mm. But she did call back. And she did. Yeah. Mm. And yeah. And that was Carver. And he had that destiny. That was all interesting. More on that in a minute, but let's move to Bjorn. Bjorn. Bjorn's ending. Bjorn's ending. Yeah. It's, uh... It's like, yeah, it, it's a bit melancholic, really. It's like, I, I don't really know what the ending means, but it means that he... Like I said, he was torn from his brother in arms, but at the same time, he was reunited with the, his love from his past in a strange mm. world. That we that some people might I mean if you're familiar with Cork you might know what it means, but for me and for Bjorn, he doesn't know what that means. He just knows that he is there with someone who is important to him. But at the same time it hurts not knowing what happened to Carver. And I liked Aww. it. Yeah, I, li- I really liked it. <laughs> well I I feel as a player the same. Sadly I feel whatever Carver became yeah, who knows? Maybe he'll see Bjorn again, but I don't think he. Uh, I don't think. I think it's like I said in that note. James Carver died. He's no more. I have, uh, Something else is now uh, in his place. Mm. I've, uh, how I've, I see it. I've written a letter to Carver. Oh my gosh. Can I hear it? Should I read it? Shall he read it, Matthias? Yeah, go ahead. Oh. <laughs> Sometime in the future, on a dark street, maybe tumbling along with the wind under a red sky and a black sun, someone might stumble upon a letter addressed to a J. Carver. It reads, Dear Carver, I'm writing this letter without much hope of you receiving it, but after all we've been through, who knows what path it might take. We only knew each other for about, what, six months? But those six months came to be the most important ones in my life, at least so far. We spilled blood together. We went through hardships of the worst kind. Such things create bonds which will never be undone. You were right, and I was wrong. There is no going back. Though some things that I thought I had left behind me have now become the most important things in my life. I have left behind the illusion of keeping on living my life as Björn von Krusencherna. Björn is dead. Killed by myself in order to flee from something I... I could never truly run from. I have no idea what happened there in the end when we were separated, but I think we did good. The curse was lifted, and who knows, maybe it was you who ended up back in the real world with Jenkins Burn in your lap. Either way, I hope you found peace. I never asked you about your past, but As we traveled together, it became clear that you were haunted by it, perhaps even more so than I was. I hope we will meet again. If not, good luck and safe travels wherever they might take you. Sincerely yours, B. I I think that's my new favorite moment of the whole thing. (laughs) (laughs) That's beautiful. That was actually amazing. Uh, Hyama, I'm actually really upset now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm generally upset. That was wonderful. <laughs> oh, yeah. gosh. That was great. Oh, 
Well, who knows? Maybe, I mean, you know, maybe the... Because the problem is now, I, I thought, like, I think because my, uh... I was telling someone about this, and they were going, Oh, come on, now you'll be a more fun character to play! And I'm like, you know what? Yeah, I will. <laughs> but I won't be James Carver. <laughs> yeah. And I won't be a good guy here. I, I don't think... Yeah. yeah. Because I I did, didn't want to spoil the illusion that much, but I would just... I had to look up Asheroff. Mm-hmm. He, had, he had to give yeah, you that. And it looks like, okay, mm. apparently he is the head honcho of all the evil. <laughs> <sighs> Wow. Which made me go, what, like, was it almost like Chigidiel's acting up a bit and maybe he wants to keep things in line? Right. Maybe that's exactly. is that the motive that is exactly. of that? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Exactly that. He must yeah. have uh, seen a great potential in uh, Carver. Yes, indeed. <laughs> oh my goodness, so, so maybe great. he has some big things in store yet. We'll have to see. Perhaps perhaps they will make a return or perhaps, perhaps we will leave it at this beautiful end. We'll... We'll have to talk it over and see what we what we do with it as we move forward. But uh, well, let's move on to you then, Matthias. Yeah, your your thoughts on the ending? Like, how different was it from what it could have been? Like, yeah, what did you, like? Did you highlight? Yeah, what, what do you, what do you think? I mean, I'm really glad that you chose to save the children and that you chose to make the uh, the human uh, the human choice. I mean, Chazenko talked about it. He talked about. Um, how, you know, the only rational thing to do really is to not let the children go because, you know, maybe the incarnate escapes. Um, and then we just repeat this again and how many people have suffered over that. But to the, the, the counterpoint to that then is uh, the icon painter Nesterov who then says that, I mean, the reason he freed them then was because that's the suffering that's in front of you right now. And we, we really can't know the future. We cannot, we cannot control the future ultimately, but we can help those that are in need right here and right now and that that is sort of the imperfect human choice to make and, and because of that it is it is the right choice um, to make uh, what happens in the future who knows but um, but I'm really glad that you made that that choice without any kind of uh, prodding you've of course have been free to do not do it also and there's an ending written out for that as well uh, but um, but uh, that, that was one thing that I, I was quite uh, quite happy about that that you chose to to go in that direction. I mean, did you say had, did you have an ending ready? Yeah, yeah, because I mean, it is a very in, in a sense, it is kind of a binary choice, right? It's let them out or don't let them out. Mm. And the way that mm. uh, the Black Madonna is written is that if you don't let them out, then um, you know, Chesenko says, yeah, the you know, the Madonna is going to save you. Don't worry. Well, the Madonna will not save you. <laughs> the Madonna doesn't care about you, ultimately. Um, so you would be actually left in uh, in Inferno, and the Nephrites would come back for you. Um, and mm. it could still have played out um, in a similar way, though. Uh, I think we probably would still have moved to the chasm, because um, that is to do with your choice of going after Isosha and... The reason the chasm opens there is because Astaroth comes to get you, uh, basically from here. Huh. Mm. So that would likely have How happened anyway. Would were you were you prepared to kill Bjorn there for a bit? I if you would have want if you would have wanted him to die there, he could have died. If 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 that would have been sort of the the fitting punishment, or uh, if that would have made his mm, journey complete in a way. Then Vova yeah. could have could have let could have let go, uh, and that would have in a way been been fitting. Also, there's also I, yeah. I put in into the ending. Uh, and if you listen to it again, you might hear it. But there are some there are some interpretations that you can make uh, in that direction. Uh, you have a stability loss at the very end, which yeah. uh, I believe takes you all the way down. Um, and then we talk about Metropolis as being this place where the sun is set and it's never going to rise again. But it ends yeah. with a blinding sunrise. So, what does that mean? Um, you can you could interpret it as oh. him killing himself uh, if you wanted to interpret it as that. But I'm not saying that that's what happens. But um, but there are ways of of reading that in there. If if one wants the end to be sort of a you know that Bjorn pays for what he has done, uh, that yeah. can be an end. Or it can also be a very happy end. I mean, happy. Uh, comparatively speaking and where he um, finally gets his love and he finally gets to be with with Vova and um, you know one, one thing that was important for me there was, was also that with with Vova with this you know we have a gay relationship there's a really typical trope in media 
uh, when you have gay relationships, you know, the gay partner always has to die uh, for whatever reason. It's been like that in Buffy, you know, whatever Mm -hmm. you watch, uh, usually it ends tragically because I guess it's supposed to show, you know, the the tragic nature of, you know, the the discrimination that exists in in society and those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to go a different direction. I wanted to say, no, no, you you get each other. You get each other at the end and you you get to be... You get to be happy if that's the way that you want to interpret that uh, ending. Um, and, yeah. So, um, I think... That's interesting. So... Yeah. Oh, you go first. I think, like, Bjorn's hope of coming back to some sort of reality there, I think that's what... And, and yeah, and, and his... Uh, and I suppose his love for Vova... And I think that's even stronger now that he's saved them on several occasions, both him and Carver. It's like, yeah, that makes him want to keep alive. Yeah, he, I think he is a very optimistic kind of character. He kept bouncing back mm. throughout the story. Yeah? Whenever things were looking the bleakest, he would he would find uh, always find something positive to latch on to mm. and, and find a way to get energy and... and uh, to get through it, so I think that's probably mm. what he would do in this situation as well. Um, so, so in terms of um, actual like looking at the campaign itself and rules and everything, like so, we actually did the ending pretty book for book how it's supposed to go down. Like you get to the church or you get the Black Madonna, and then they have a big yep. fight, and and that yeah, that was all pretty like yep that on the ball. That is that is uh, how the the campaign goes basically. That the the, the end part is more. It's not really scripted, but it, it has some sort of sort of key scenes that are uh, that are clear there. That yes, you get go to the cathedral. One of you gets the the black Madonna within them. Uh, is chosen. What decides that? Is that just up to GM like discretion or like? I think it was the one with the highest soul um, gets it. Uh, so that's why mm-hmm. uh, why it's uh, why it is uh, you. Uh, I was I think you also you were talking about it in the in the end uh, or in that episode about like but surely this vessel is tainted surely you know it cannot be. Yeah. But I really wanted to ensure that it it was you. Um, I think it really feels mm. right that it was Carver, yeah. Um, and yeah, it really gives him also a big a big moment there. Um, so. Mm. Yeah, but but yeah, the the, the, awesome. um, the way that that goes, that is pretty much set. But then you know, the chasm is completely ours, and many other many other uh, things are are indeed ours. The um, the official ending, like the original ending to the Black Madonna, is very kind of almost anticlimactic. It's like, yeah, you're back in reality. The Ivan Chesenko and uh, the KGB lictor are kind of mad at you for uh, you know for for not leaving the children in there if that's what you have done but then they leave you alone uh, and then kind of just sort of fades away so one of the things we did for the new version was that we put in a, a, a new ending where um, basically you you are on the run from all the people that you have ended up injuring you know throughout this journey the Slavic Association the Gemeinschaft, Gemeinschaft and all that and you get a choice of going into the dream world and going to to Piotr there and, and, and living out your days in the dream world or, you know, living a life on the run. And then the original or, or the, the end scene that we put in, uh, that I put into the new version of Black Madonna is 2017. Um, it's the, the victory parade, um, you know, the end of the Second World War um, and seeing all these like mobile nuclear missile launchers and, you know, seeing Putin and all his guys out there, you know, everything is exactly as it was before the Soviet Union collapsed. Nothing has essentially changed. Um, and, and sort of using the fact that, yeah, it was originally written in 1991 when we thought things were going in one direction, and now we are here when we see mm. that things have, have gone in very much a, a, a different way. Come back to, yeah. Yeah, so that that is oh, how wow. it was there. I don't know if we will end up using that. You'll, if you hear this, you will have heard if we chosen to include it. But otherwise, I think it's our ending is our ending and it's really focused on your characters and i think yeah no no that 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 that, that that's I, I think that's absolutely brilliant i it was just one of those things i was curious about because obviously all these adventures do have a sort of generic ending because i was wondering like for you when did our ending really come into like you knew, like beyond maybe they make the binary choice like how, when did you go like that's gonna be how it ends 
It was if, did, <clears throat> if you did. Yeah. Yeah. No, but I, I think uh, having the you know Vova and and Bjorn and having uh, you know what happens to Carver, um, that was something that it has been sort of it's been a long process in my mind thinking about like how how should mm. it end and and then I came I decided basically just uh, about maybe a week before we we did the play session that no this is this feels right this feels like a fitting way to end it especially given everything that had you had done then in the the, the recent um, sessions mm. um, did you feel you pushed us then towards uh, saving the children no I, I did, didn't actually um, and I think it would have been okay even if you wouldn't have uh, saved the children actually I think that maybe in a way that would have made certain aspects of the like the, the, the more punishing aspect of it would have would have then been even clearer um, so no I, I don't feel like you, I pushed you in that direction and I, I was just very interested that you made that choice because uh, you know it's not at all strange to, to side with Chizenko and say look the rational thing is let's break the cycle let's not mm. let's not allow this to happen again that would have been a perfectly rational choice to make but you were so clear from the beginning that no I mean we need to change we need to save them we, we cannot leave them I don't know. I mean, I, I think I went a little bit back and forth, but I was discussing this a little bit with uh, Craig actually after you had left at the last uh, after the last session. We stayed back a little bit, uh, and we were talking about, or at least I made the point that you had sort of put in things with regard to the children, as in uh, Carver's parents and his childhood. And you know the, the troubles there that that kind of would motivate him to want to save them, uh, finding his parents in the, in, the, in the orphanage, and uh, with me uh, the meetings I had with my daughter, uh, uh, how that would sort of push me in that direction as well, because I don't think Bjorn was certain which way to go. I wasn't at all until it sort of happened, but definitely influenced by that scene mm. that's excellent mm. it, it, it mm. was not I mean, at all why those scenes were really included um, to, yeah. it wasn't there to, to sort of push you in that direction it was more just you know those were those were your backgrounds in a way And uh, but I'm yeah. happy to hear that they they um, that they, they did have an impact they played a part yeah. mm. Mm. I mean I think for me as well I was swaying as well because I, I basically had it like this James Carver saved the children evil servant of Astaroff. Yes, do as you're told. You know, who cares, you know. I, I was kind of trying to... I don't know how if that came across, but I was trying those last sessions to play the idea of... Yeah, as it ended up being, that I was becoming something else. And that was the side of me that was loving the demon summoning, laughing at all the death, like, ah, who cares? And James was still trying to hold on, like, no, no. And, and that for me was like, no, James... Because James didn't want to play games anymore. He felt doing what Ivan told us to do was just another do what Chikidiel tells you to do, do what Pagodin tells you what to do, all of that. And he was like, no, saving the children was his choice. We decided to save the children. We weren't told to do it. Yeah. I mean, we were, but you know what I mean? Like, it felt that was what we as humans wanted to do. And we did so it. So it's a defiant act then, almost. Yeah. In a way, yeah. Yeah, for, for Carver in the end. It was the defiance of thinking he'd lost everything and this was the last thing he would do would be something that he felt was good mm. Mm. before it was taken from him. Yeah. Which it was. Oh. Oh. That's beautiful. Um, I'm, I'm happy to hear that, uh, that the, ending had, the ending had some... And it resounded that there was... You had a lot of feelings around it and uh, that it made you mm. think. Um, and that's, of course, how any ending no. ultimately should be. Exactly. Ending. No, it was really good. And in a way, we almost got every important mystery solved. You know, beyond the big things. I mean, Chikidiel was awesome in the end. I feel Chikidiel as an antagonist, like, we didn't need to meet him. We didn't need to fight him. It was just enough that, like, if anything, that final image of his citadel, I think, was the most you ever needed to see of him. Like, that was perfect. Like, here's his realm. And the whole adventure, I think, is shaped by Chikidiel, isn't mm -hmm. it, really? I imagine if you choose the other antagonists, you'd know about this, Matthias, but I imagine they all have a little flavor that would be different. Yeah, I mean, they have... Uh, each each mm. uh, of the Death Angels have certain sort of types of suffering and, and, and um, mm. you know, themes that they are working with, and, and Chikidiel mm. is very much about, you know, he's the bloodstained patriarch, he is about the abuse of children, um, and mm. uh, that is, of course, going throughout the entire adventure is... Um, is yeah 
him and, and, and what he's about. I suppose the only thing that I'll ask you now, the only thing I thought, it wasn't important, but I'm curious, I still wasn't ever quite sure. Why did it all begin in the first place? Like, why did Magda suddenly... Why would she had to be she being cursed? Because she'd been cursed before we even got there. So why... Who, was that all, like, to start a catalyst that Magda gets cursed, then the, the other three get worried, and then they get killed? Like, like yeah, like, who starts that? Is that Chigidiel? Or? My interpretation is that, I mean, the first time Chigidiel incarnates is in the middle of the Siege of Leningrad, when shit is really hitting the fan um, during World War Two. Like, it's at, at the darkest mm. point, basically, in Russia, right? Um, and 50 years later, 1991, the Soviet Union is about to collapse. There's some major... Uh, things that are about to happen, some major chaos upcoming, and uh, my interpretation is that Chigidil sees that as, this is my opportunity. Now I, I put uh, my, my, my plan into place, now I, I execute on it, now I, I get the incarnates loose again, because uh, hmm. now my enemies are weak, uh, and this is an opportunity for me to, 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 to make my plans come true. So that's why it's happening right then, uh, together with the, the fall of the Soviet Union. Hmm. hmm. Interesting. Very interesting. Uh, yeah, and yeah, and then, <clears throat> like I said, you, we won't find out who Jenkins was, but we at least give a hint. Like, ugh, was he on the good side or the bad side? That's what I want to know. I mean, neither. I mean, like, he was I, neutral. I think that 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 Jenkins' uh, true nature is something for all of us to to decide upon for ourselves. But I mean, for me personally. I would say that uh, that he is certainly on the good side. I mean, if you think about the things okay, that, right. that uh, yeah. he has sort of pushed you towards and the things that he is, the moments you've shared with him, they have all been about being a good person and about love and about, you know, mm-hmm. finding some kind of comfort in this, this horrible reality that we live in. So, yeah, um, you know, he's he is not... Uh, he's not Astroth. <laughs> I can tell you that much. I think you were yeah. suspecting. Like, awesome. Was he uh, awesome. actually the Black Sun from the beginning? Was it all a big game? <laughs> no, no, it wasn't. <laughs> I know, that would be, yeah. No, that, I'll take that. That's awesome. Mm. Uh, Bjorn, what about you? Any final whole campaign mystery that you'd like? A whole campaign mystery? Yeah, because I felt otherwise most things I felt were resolved in terms of my character, what was going on. But I mean, there's anything you still thought, like, what was that about? I, I remember now that you mentioned that that you actually asked me that also after the last session that oh hmm. the, the, the the card with the owl that never got resolved all the people that were after you and uh, they realized then that maybe that didn't come through for everyone that who the owl card came from well, what did it say again? I'll, I will be seeing you. It's I will a, be seeing you soon. It is an actual card like that that I found on on Google. Uh, I was searching for like greeting <laughs> cards with owls, and then it was I'll be seeing you. Um, <laughs> but yeah, like who who is it from? But I no, mean, that maybe was you over. can. Yeah. Mm. Yes, it was. Over. Yeah, yeah. I, I I told you there. People can speculate if they want to, but yeah. <laughs> okay, that aside, mysteries. Yeah. That is that is it. No other mysteries. No. I can't. I'm trying to think of something, but I. Um, I don't know. I think. It's like, it's like I I kind of know, or what I want to know, I guess, mm. uh, because I know. I I I don't know how what what the ending means really. For example, but like you said, we could interpret that in different ways. Because for but, a moment, I thought... Here's what my interpretation of it was. I thought maybe you would... The whole point was that Metropolis was reality. Yeah. That everything we saw anyway was just an illusion and that actually reality yeah. is we are there. So I thought it was supposed to reflect that you now saw the world as it as truly it is. is. Yeah. Yes. And that is, that is the truth. I thought. That That's is the truth. Metropolis is yeah. the world as it really yeah. is. And Elysium is yeah. the illusion. Yeah. That is uh, our world as we think it is. Um, and, and that is that is an illusion. So yes, Bjorn uh, finds himself at the end in in the real world. But the sun comes up, so something is clearly wrong. Something is clearly wrong. So there's plenty of plenty of myster- mystery left there, which I think there should be. There should be some mystery left. There yeah, should be. I like that. Oh yes, it's interesting no, no, because I... I would never have known that the sun coming up was a mystery unless you had pointed it out. <laughs> now. Um, I'm trying to think through the whole thing. 
But no, I, I don't feel that there is something that I'm still sort of wondering what it actually was. Mm. I... No, that's good. Like I said, I felt he did. I felt in the in, in those last two episodes, you did actually manage to almost address everything that was important. Yeah. In a way, which I think is great. Like, and it, again, and still plenty of mystery like in the terms of big stuff, but like everything that we needed to know. Yeah. You, you, yeah, was addressed. It was interesting, though, because as I wrote in this letter from uh, Bjorn here, that he uh, he never found out much about Carver, really. I mean... Because I never, even at the end, I never, like, with never, the, even with the last bit, that, like, they're just some children. They're just some children. And he didn't really because ask about it, either. It's like, yeah. I feel... A little bit. Then. I feel if we had a few minutes, like, if, if the chasm opening was a slow thing, like... Like in Lord of the Rings, if you will, where they're waiting for yeah. the. Uh, <laughs> I feel I probably would have answered anything you asked me, Bjorn. But it didn't. Answered. It didn't really make sense to to do it either. To like suddenly mm. there was there wasn't ever any moment to just spill your guts because it didn't really matter to what was actually going on there in the moment. It's like, okay, yeah, why it's is what, this hunting? It's why us? when you did it to me why when you did to me I felt it was awesome because I felt you as a character thought it was really important to tell me about yourself and I was like yeah mm. yeah because it, it would affect both of us potentially it's like so that was a reason mm. yes indeed well I think we have come to the end here and uh, we will uh, do another little post-mortem uh, thing uh, when we have released all the episodes so we will have a reason to come back but um, I'd just like to, to thank you guys so much for, for the pleasure of, of, uh, of this campaign and, and for spending all this time together. Um, I have uh, really, really enjoyed it as the Game Master, and uh, I hope you have enjoyed it as players as well. Yeah. I really have. I, like I said, I spent the first hour after we'd done recording, I was like, I don't know what to do myself. Yeah. Like, what do I do? What uh, happens now? I was thinking that... This is probably the first uh, pen and paper campaign or, uh, that I've actually finished. I started loads of them, like getting into them and making cool characters, and then it just kind of runs out in the sand or something like that. But this is the first one that I probably finished. It felt amazing. Yeah, I, I, and I'm and, uh, very excited that this is start, uh, the start of our uh, collaboration. Very excited. Yes, I think it's a very good um, grounding because I'm now looking forward to what comes next. Hopefully, yeah. many things. Uh, that's what I want. Yeah, which says a lot about <clears throat> how good this was. Yeah, and yeah, I actually agree with you. On this will probably be the first one I have definitively finished. Most of the other ones have kind of had a like a seasonal ending, but it's been implied that there was going to be more, and then we don't we didn't end up doing them. But this was the first like full character arc storyline. I even went and worked the other day and had to tell one person. <laughs> and I was like, "God, there was like you know another writer." And I was like, "Oh, it was just it. It felt like actually finishing a book, like writing a book together with people, and we actually finished yeah. it. The end. Like yeah. yes, oh. beautiful. That is the perfect place to end this. So thank you guys, and uh, the adventures continue. Goodbye. Yeah. Goodbye. Goodbye." Bjorn. <laughs> Goodbye, James. <laughs>